of uh, uh, you know preventing cancer is uh, is in our hands we just have to change our lifestyle and that can make a very big difference to our susceptibility of cancer so nekat and myself and the whole care team has been in on the path of educating people about prevention of cancer as well as providing therapy for those who are going through cancer so today we're going to talk to all those people who want to know what they can do on an everyday basis to decrease their chances of cancer um and also maybe you know educate other people around them to know uh, uh how to treat themselves further if they're going through cancer so i do have a presentation that i'm going to show but this is a very interactive session if you all have questions please feel free to type it in the chat box um and we will be answering that for you we will keep Uh, a good 20 minutes or half now at the end of the session to answer all your questions we received multiple questions as well prior to the session and we will answer all of them for you as much as and as many as we can so to just get started i will be sharing my screen and i just want to check with you guys if you all all can see my screen now yes yes okay perfect um all right so this is a very bold statement it's one which is unfortunately uh, or fortunately true um, so eating the right foods can actually decrease your risk of cancer by 30 to 40% so it's as simple as saying that um you know a big contributing factor of your susceptibility to cancer today is the kind of food that you eat and nikhat and i are going to go really deep into what kinds of food are those and where really those foods should be sourced from very important and how it should be incorporated into your diet so this session is also going to be talking about different pre existing medical conditions that we all go through each one of us will probably have this issue and how we can uh, actually eradicate the issue and improve our immune system and decrease our risk of getting cancer this is um so like i said uh, nikhat and myself will be facilitators of the session um our goal of the session is to make you understand how important food is in the role it plays in preventing cancer nikhat is a medically trained clinical nutritionist she is actually specialized in oncology nutrition she has worked with over 500 cancer patients we have uh, assessed and reported substantial improvements in the patient's recovery and healing and clinical outcomes by just changing their food so nikhat is the go to person when it comes to uh, onco nutrition i myself come from an integrative uh, therapeutic background that is nothing but using holistic and lifestyle therapies to improve the outcome which means the improve the recovery rates of a patient i have been specializing in cancer for over 10 years now and i also come from a movement uh, and uh, exercise cancer exercise background which is something that i will also talk about further later as we go along right so um few factors that contribute towards developing cancer so these are the ones that after a lot of research we have marked down and i would really urge all of you to read through this there are about 15 factors over here and you will notice that the one that i am uh, or we are most concerned with is uh, or the few that we're concerned with number one being inflammation so this word inflammation is something that you you know uh, i'm sure many of you are hearing you know very often these days uh inflammation can happen in the system if you're eating the wrong type of food if the, you have a uh, uh, a poor di digestive system um it is one which basically creates disturbance in your gut it uh, it, it basically uh, exasperates um free radicals in the body and also the rogue cells then can become malignant cells if there's high inflammation in the body and high inflammation like i said is caused by you know the wrong kinds of food is caused by low absorbability rates in the gut so your digestion is very important for cancer prevention um inflammation can happen because of stress which is another factor that we mentioned over here and uh high fat percentages as well stress is something that we all experience on an everyday basis uh there is a segment which is acute stress and then there is one which is chronic stress chronic stress is the one that we want to avoid it is the one that we feel on a regular basis which is an underlying 
uh, you know, uh, stress that we feel uh, for many, many years. And this, what it does is it releases high levels of the stress hormone into the body, which is cortisol. And that also causes inflammation in the body, in the gut and uh, a weakened immune system. Um, we look at emotional factors, physical activity. There are a lot, a lot of studies now proving that high fat percentages are leading to multiple cancers, be it breast cancer, colon cancers, uh, and various other types, liver cancer, and various other types of cancers. Uh, family history, history does play an important role as well. Uh, genetics too. If you do have a family history of cancer, I urge you to do a genetic test. I urge you to be a little more prompt with your uh, cancer screenings, and we will tell you exactly what kind of screenings you can do uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so an immunity, of course, is the be all and end all of health. I think that this is something that we have seen with what we have just gone through in the last one year, where, um, you know, we were attacked by a virus and the only, uh, the only thing that we could do to um, fight the virus was to keep our immune systems high. And it's somewhat similar to cancer as well, while cancer is a very complex disease. Um, and I'm not going to trivialize it by just saying that we have to have a strong immune system, but immunity plays a very big, big factor in uh, protecting us from, from a cold to cancer. So uh, while we all are prone to getting cancer, it is our immune system that really protects us from it. Um, so this is something that is the basis of our conversation today. It is the basis of what we do in our company, Cairo, and how we actually help cancer patients and prevent cancer as well. So these are 15 uh, different factors that can contribute to your risks of cancer. At the end of this presentation, in fact, our team of specialists, uh, medical doctors, uh, clinical nutritionists uh, have come together and we created a cancer risk assessment. This is a lifestyle risk assessment that you can very easily take uh, by yourself and we will do the results for you and let you know where you stand on that scale of your susceptibility to cancer. Are you, you know, uh, low susceptibility? Are you low to moderate, moderate to high or high susceptibility? But it doesn't end there because then we can tell you exactly what you need to do on an everyday basis to bring your risks down. So while you have the information, you also have the tools and the methods on what you can do today to bring your risk down. So that is an assessment we will send to you at the end of the presentation and all of you all can uh, do the assessment and we will give you all the reports back uh, in the next 24 hours or so. I will now move um, to the next slide, which I'm going to pass on this presentation to Nikot, um, who will take it further. And uh, she will be starting with the pre-existing medical conditions that can increase your risk of cancer. So Nikot, over to you. Thanks, Amara. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so yes, now, as you see on the screen, so these are the few pre-existing medical conditions that can increase your chances of having cancer in the future. Now, say, for example, if you have had chronic diabetes and you have been unable to manage your sugar levels uh, on normal side, that can create a havoc in the body by creating a lot of inflammation. And as Samara was saying, if there is a lot of inflammation for over a long duration of time for years together, that could be one of the sole reason in itself for uh, one to have cancer in the future. So all of these conditions, as you can see over here, um, like chronic diabetes, COPD, chronic obesity, hormonal issues, chronic gut issues, all of these things, uh, in case if you're suffering from these, I would urge you to get treated for uh, for this, not only in terms of medications, but uh, importantly, in terms of your lifestyle, because the, the changes that you bring about in terms of lifestyle are going to remain with you for a long duration of time, rather than just taking a pill and then getting rid of it. So I would urge you guys to maintain your blood sugar level or to reduce the extra high, extra or high body fat percentages or to bring your hormonal levels uh, back to normal or in case if you have had any gut issues to get these treated uh, rather than just ignoring them so that you don't get your body in the position of having high inflammation and then that leading to cancer in the future. Now, uh, yes, now uh, I'll tell you how to manage all of these uh, with few dietary tips. Uh, Samara, next slide. Yes, now these are a few of the tips that you can use to manage all of those conditions that I mentioned about. Uh, so uh, you can practice a low carb diet, low carbohydrate diet for the example to which I'll be showing in the next slide. And uh, you are supposed to eat foods that are low in glycemic index. 
Now, first, let me tell you what the glycemic index is. It's the rate at which your body is able to absorb glucose. Now, say, uh, I'll give you an example. Say, if you take a fruit, a whole fruit or a fruit juice. Now, when you drink a fruit juice, your body is able to absorb that very soon when compared to a whole fruit. Now, the reason why is that because of the fiber content. So what I would suggest is you need to eat foods that are low in glycemic index. Example, uh, it could be whole grains or green leafy vegetables or nuts and seeds or eggs or uh, organic fish or organic chicken because these are low in glycemic index. Uh, so that is something that you need to follow. And also you need to eat foods that are low in total carbohydrate load. Now, for example, uh, if you're going to have an avocado, I know it's low in glycemic index, but at the same time, it could be high in carbs as well. So it doesn't mean you're going to binge and uh, eat on your fruits. So you'll have to be really careful when you uh, concentrate on eating the uh, foods as well. Now, a few of them say the whole grains is uh, completely okay to eat for a diabetic person, but uh, you need to uh, know how much of carbohydrates to eat as well. So in case if you need more information on this, you can also get in touch uh, with us personally. And then uh, you got to include foods uh, like good quality fat, for example, eggs and fish and nuts and seeds, because these are very good sources of omega-3 fatty acid. And as uh, we discussed before, we need to bring that inflammation down. In, uh, in order for you to bring that inflammation down, you need to eat foods like cruciferous vegetables, green leafy vegetables and uh, omega-3s. So these are the few foods that can help in bringing down the inflammation and avoid foods like sugar, refined or processed food, artificial sweeteners. And uh, you need to avoid snacking in between to restrict your insulin spikes. Now, previously, the dietary guidelines used to say that you need to eat something small for every two to three hours in order to control your sugar levels. But that's not the case. Now, you've you got to make sure that you're not going to spike your insulin levels again and again in order to avoid that inflammation uh, taking place in the body. So you need to avoid those snacking in between. Rather, in, in case, even if you do snack in between, you've got to take something that is low in carbs and at the same time, low in glycemic index as well. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, uh, this is one of the sample diet plan um, uh, for a person uh, who's been uh, suffering from diabetes. Now, if you see over here, as I've been telling you, you've got to take foods that are low in glycemic index. So every food item that I've included over here is low in glycemic index or it's either low in uh, its glycemic load or the total carbohydrate content. So the first thing early in the morning, uh, for example, you can have a teaspoon of methi seeds because that is something that is shown to improve the insulin sensitivity. And then uh, and your first meal for the day shouldn't be high in glycemic load or glycemic index. So here is some, uh, why I have included few eggs as a part of the breakfast. Or in case if you're a pure vegetarian, you could go for something like broccoli or cauliflower upma. And then uh, 11 a.m. in the morning as a mid-morning snack in case if you need, you can go for something like a handful of nuts and seeds, which is a source of very good quality fat. And at the same time, low in glycemic index and low in carb carbohydrate load as well. And lunch is somewhere uh, wherein you can have a small portion of your whole grains or your uh, pulses or legumes, uh, but just make sure you're starting your meal with your uh, vegetable salad or some sabzi rather than binge, binge eating on your whole grains like your roti or rice. And then in between, again, uh, rather than giving you anything that is that has carbs in it, I have given a small cup of green tea, which again has uh, catkins in it, which is uh, which helps in improving your immunity, boosting your metabolism, and it's anti-cancerous at the same time. And in the evening, just make sure you finish your dinner as early as possible. And uh, the food items I've included over here are again low in glycemic index and at the same time low in glycemic load as well. So this is how, this is a typical diet plan that you can use in case if you have high fat percentage or if you have diabetes as well. And at the same time, uh, in case if you have a little bit of hormonal issues as well. So, and in case if you do need uh, further information and uh, uh, in personalized diet plan, you can always get in touch with us as well. Yes. Now, uh, moving on to the immunity essentials. Now, as you can see, there are a few uh, food items that I've mentioned um, as immunity essentials. Now, these, you don't have to go anywhere outside to bring them in. So these are a few food items that are usually available in our kitchen or in our garden. 
uh, for example, curcumin, which is nothing but the bioactive compound that is present in the turmeric that we usually Indians use on a regular basis. So, but then one thing that you need to know about curcumin is it is better absorbed when it is taken along with uh, either fat or with black pepper. So in case, even if you do add in the food, we uh, usually use a little bit of oil while cooking. So there's a good absorption there. Or in case, if you take it in the form of a concoction tomorrow, make sure you do add a little bit of black pepper to it. So that the absorption of curcumin is good. Or something like garlic. You now garlic also has a compound called as allyl, which is a sulfur compound that helps in boosting our immunity. And it has also shown to be anti-cancerous or say something like ginger. It has a bioactive compound called gingerol. So the same way all of these foods like amla, gooseberry, cinnamon, star anise, green tea, or tulsi leaves, which is found in our pots or in the garden. So all of these have like at least one bioactive compound that helps in boosting our immunity, reducing our inflammation in the body. And also uh, they have been proven to be anti-cancerous as well. Not only these, but there are other foods as well that we usually use on a regular basis in our kitchen. For example, cauliflower or cabbage uh, that has got um, isothiocyanate or sulforaphane. This is a bioactive compound which is present in it, or lycopene which is present in the tomatoes. So all of these, most of the compound, most of the foods items that we usually use uh, on a regular basis in our kitchen are uh, anti-cancerous or help in boosting immunity. We need to make sure uh, that we use these on a regular basis, and there should be variety in our diet, and that's the main important thing. And also uh, the next one is the immunity scale. Now, if you want to measure your immunity, uh, I urge you to take this test. We can do this right now. Samara, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, uh, we just score ourselves over here. I'm gonna read, read out the questions. Samara, you were saying something? Yes, yeah, no, go ahead, Nikhil. So uh, you can read out the questions and then just tell them how to do it. If you can give them about five to 10 minutes and uh, they can actually score um, uh, their, you know, their numbers and they, this will give you an understanding of where you really lie. It's a very uh, service level understanding of whether you're in low immunity, you're average or you have pretty high immune system. Yes. So the very first question is, do you smoke or drink alcohol on a regular basis? If your answer is yes, then please score yourself as plus one. And if your answer is no, then you're going to score yourself minus one. Okay. Uh, and uh, the next question, do you have high stress levels? And if you do have high stress levels, please score yourself plus one. And if you do not have high stress levels, score yourself minus one. Next question. Do you get sound sleep? And if you do sleep well, then score yourself minus one. And if you really cannot sleep well on a regular basis, and if you have disturbed sleep on every now and then, then it's going to be plus one. Next question. Do you constantly catch a cold or flu? And if you do, then score yourself plus one. And if you do not, then score yourself minus one. Uh, just, just a minute. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so do you need more than two courses of antibiotics per year? And um, if no, you score yourself minus one. And if yes, you score yourself plus one. This is um, a very important factor because we tend to, uh, you know, uh, pop multiple antibiotics but this creates havoc in the gut. And later you'll understand why having a healthy digestive system is the answer to a high immune system. Um, so if you start having too many antibiotics, it really destroys the good bacteria in the gut. So this is something to keep in mind. If you do not need to have antibiotics, please do not take it unless it's extremely, extremely uh, required. Uh, Nikhat, you can take it forward from here. Yes. And uh, the next question is, do you constantly feel tired? And uh, if you do, then rate yourself plus one. And if you do not, then it's going to be minus one. 
Next question. Do you have frequent episodes of diarrhea or gas or constipation? And if you do, you're going to score yourself plus one. And if you do not, you're going to score yourself minus one. Next question. Do you engage yourself in any kind of exercise on a regular basis? And if you do on a regular basis, then score yourself minus one. And if you do not, then it's going to be plus one. Okay, somebody has texted saying question four seems to be scored. I didn't really understand that. Um, hey, if, you don't, I, if, you don't, if you catch cold, yes. uh, and if you say yes, and you're scoring plus one, it shouldn't be plus one, right? It should be minus one. You shouldn't be catching cold or too often. If you do catch cold on and off on a regular basis, then it's going to be plus one. And if you do not, then eventually you would be subtracting from the final score. Your score is supposed to be lesser, so it's going to be minus one. Yeah, but higher the score, higher the immunity, right? No, 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 it's not, no. Higher the score, the lower the immunity. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and... Uh, but then uh, question one is contradictory, right? If you smoke or drink, plus one if yes. Yes. So if you're going to smoke, then it's going to be plus one. So that means you're higher the score, then that okay. means your immunity is lower. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, do you eat at least three to four varieties of fruits and vegetables on a regular basis? And this is on a regular basis, remember? So if you do eat fruits and vegetables on a regular basis, then it's going to be minus one. And if you do not on a regular basis, then it's going to be plus one. Also in the next question, do you take herbs and spices on a regular basis? And if you do take herbs and spices on a regular basis, then it's going to be a minus one. And if you do not take herbs and spices on a regular basis, then it's going to be plus one. And do you consume sugar on a regular basis? And this doesn't have to be the white refined sugar that we usually use on a regular basis. It could be the chocolates, the sweets, ice creams, uh, uh, anything that has sugar or refined sugar added in it. And if you do take these foods on a regular basis, then score yourself plus one. And if you do not eat these things on a regular basis, then it's minus one. And then next question, do you consume refined or processed or ready to eat food items on a regular basis? Then you're going to score yourself plus one. And if you do not, then it's minus one. You can calculate your score now. Yeah, and if your score is anywhere between in minus to plus four, say if, even if it's like minus two, minus three, or minus 12, minus 10, anywhere in minus to plus four, then your immunity is high. Do you guys need some time to uh, calculate? Do I wait? No, I think we're good to go, Nikhil. So uh, as she said, and then anywhere between four to eight is average and anywhere more than eight is low immunity. Um, a lot of the time we see that people who tend to fall sick very easily or you know, when the weather changes, this is a usual that we get that, you know, the weather is changing, I'm falling sick. It's not normal to fall sick when the weather changes all the time. Um, anyone who has a, a, low, a pretty high immunity will not be so susceptible to weather changes or unless you really, uh, you know, kind of um, exert yourself. 
So um, there will be certain factors over here that will push your score up or push your score down. And I think you will get an understanding of which those factors are and what you need to change. Um, see, this is not some, this, there's nothing to be worried here. There's no definitive answer that, you know, because you have a very low immunity, you suddenly are going to get cancer. It's nothing like that. It's just to give you an understanding of where you stand on the spectrum and what are the certain factors that can, uh, in, you know, uh, decrease or increase your immunity and that you know what you can do to make those changes. Uh, but as we go along, you will learn a lot more and uh, you can make the changes. And I'm, I can, you know, and this is, this is after a lot of, working with tons of patients to tell you that just these small little changes, you will see how you can build your immunity and, uh, you know, just making these small lifestyle changes, you, you will definitely improve your immune systems. So that's something that we can definitely assure you. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, slide, but I hope you guys had an under you know, got a good understanding of this. So somebody has a oh. question, uh, is immunity a function of age? Nika, do you want to answer that? Um, now, uh, it depends from person to person, actually. See, what happens is, now, if you see, for example, I'll give you an example over here. Now, there's a connection between your gut and immune system. Now, as in when we age, what happens is the beneficial bacteria that is present in our intestine or colon, it seems to start declining. So when that happens, the, bad, bad, the count of the bad bacteria eventually starts increasing. So that could also be, yes, to some extent, I can tell you that it, it is a function of age. So as in when you start aging, your immune system starts declining to some extent. Yes, definitely. But I will add over here that uh, while it is a contributing factor, it is not the only factor. There are a lot of people who are much older than all of us and who have a very high immune system. Uh, like I said, gut, uh, or like Nikhil said, gut plays one role, one role in your immune system. Uh, there are other factors like very importantly, high fat percentages, very importantly, stress, um, very important factor, actually, um, you know, uh, then you have also your genetic factors that play an important role, your environment, the air that you're breathing can uh, play a very important role. So, um, and, and of course, the nutrition that you're, you're ingesting. Um, which is related to your gut. So age does play a role, but it is not the only factor and it can be overcompensated with the other elements being, uh, you know, in place. Okay. And uh, just another question, mostly questions we'll take towards the end, but this is kind of relevant. So we talked about inflammation uh, being one of the main things, right? So what exactly is, I mean, how do you define inflammation and uh, how long of an inflammation causes cancer? Is there like a hard and fast uh, uh, rule? Nika, do you want to take that? Now, I'll tell you what inflammation exactly is. Now, um, uh, you know, the mosquito bite. So when a mosquito bites you, you see that small bump over your skin. So that is also nothing but one of the inflammations. Now, imagine that inflammation happening inside your body, inside your arteries for a long duration of time. So uh, uh, there's no specific um, defined period as such, like, you know, two years or three years or 10 years or 20, 10, 20 years where there is inflammation over a long duration of time and then that leads to cancer. There's no specific duration of time as such. But yes, if you have any of those pre-existing conditions, now imagine that bump being there in your arteries somewhere. Okay, now it's not the cholesterol that causes the inflammation actually. Now it's uh, it's eating a lot of refined food items causes a lot of free radical damage. And that free radical damage will cause an inflammation in your arteries. So that's when the cholesterol starts clogging into your arteries. And that is a reason for one to have atherosclerosis or uh, heart disease in the future. Now this inflammation, as I said, there's no specific defined period of time uh, for it to cause cancer in the future. But that inflammation along with any other pre-existing condition like your diabetes, or if you have uh, anything like extreme gut issues or say something like you know uh, pulmonary diseases, over a duration of time, if you are not maintaining your uh, disease, if the disease management is not happening well in terms of your lifestyle and at the same time medications, that's when uh, we can end up having something like cancer in the future. But there's no definitive defined period as such. Cool, thanks. Um, okay. yes. uh, yeah, Nikita, you can go ahead. 
Yes, to move on, as I was saying, um, yes, now 70% of our immune system uh, exists in our gut. Now, when I say this, I'll tell you why. Now, um, our gut has these beneficial bacteria present that will help in improving our immune system by not letting the harmful bacteria grow in our intestine. So that is uh, how our gut actually uh, helps in uh, simulating uh, the immune cells present in our body. And it helps in distinguishing between the bad bacteria and the good bacteria, and therefore avoiding the bad bacteria to overgrow the good bacteria. And so therefore it's very important as to what we eat and drink on a regular basis. So if you're gonna continue to eat something like you know, refined sugar or processed food items, that eventually decreases a load of good bacteria and the load of bad bacteria will eventually increase causing a havoc in our gut or digestive system. So that is why I was saying that 70% of our immune system exists in our gut. Not only that, our gut directly has a connection uh, with our mind as well. Now, sometimes if you must have noticed, what happens with me is if I'm upset, um, I'm not, I, I don't feel the appetite to eat at all. I don't feel like eating at all. So that means my mind, because it has all these um, uh, nerves ending in your gut. Okay, so that means your gut is sending out the signals, sorry, your mind is sending out the signals to your gut. So that's how these two are connected. So um, uh, in order for you to have a better mental well-being as well, you need to make sure that you're maintaining your gut health up to the par. So that's really important. And if not, you might also notice that you would end up having something like chronic diarrhea, constipation, something as simple as, uh, you know, bloating or gas, which most of us suffer on a regular basis or something like, you know, estrophageal reflux disease, where you have this extreme acidity and you're not able to retain food sometimes. So these are like few of the common issues um, that uh, people face if your uh, gut uh, or digestive system is not on the par. So I just want to add, it's as simple as this. The, you know, they, they speak about, they have, you, you actually have more nerve endings in your uh, system than you have in your entire central nervous system. So it's all of us, the second we feel uh, nerve excited, where do we feel it first? We actually first feel it in the pit of our stomach. That is our gut because we have things at the, uh, in our gut. Um, this also basically suggests Yes, immune system lies in the gut and it's and the reason being because whatever nutrition we, we can eat the health and i have experienced you know different types of people who are on the health you can ever imagine whether they are eating pure organic food from and and morning to night no meat no this no dairy whatever it might be uh, that seems to be the health diet but still have really bad digestive system and a really low immune system that's because even if a very uh, healthy diet if your digestion is not a hundred percent or even close to that that's absorb nutrients you're going to be uh, um, you know releasing all the nutrients from the body it is not going to be absorbed so your where is your immunity going to come from if you're not absorbing the good food you're eating and then you're not going to immune system so you have to always see what is happening with your gut. And this is a topic of the, you know, what we discuss with all our patients, all our clients, uh, on our social media. Everywhere is about healthy digestive system and gut. I think it's a it's over 70% is chronically constipation, uh, constipated. Now, that's a big problem. I know people who have to wake up. First thing they do is have to have a cigarette to be able to go to the toilet. That's not good because of the fact that there's something wrong with your gut. Uh, another condition is those people who eat and they need to run to the toilet immediately. So there is either it's IBS or either, you know, there's leaky gut, something with your gut that uh, uh, you're either constipated or you're excessively, uh, you have area or, um, you know, you have acid reflux or whatever. So your body is always telling you that something is and what we tend to do because it's sometimes quite minor we just tend to ignore it and think it's a way of life but then another very strong factor that can influence inflammation and then can lead to a lot of uh, you know cancers we have seen it from colorectal to stomach cancers and so on and so forth and other other chronic conditions as well so um, I, I really really push all of you guys to you know if you really want to make a difference to your health it's your it's it's the uh, the gut that you really have to focus on. So that's very, very important. Uh, Shamin, do we have any questions or we can move on to the next slide? 
we can move on to the next slide. Okay, perfect. Yes. So uh, how do you improve your gut basically is including probiotic foods. Now, these are the fermented food. Uh, probiotic is nothing but the fermented food products that contain live beneficial bacteria in it. For example, you know, all of us must be eating yogurt or curd on a regular basis in our diet. So that is one of the best fermented foods with the live beneficial bacteria in it. So I would ask everyone to continue to do that. And apart from that, there are other sources as well. For example, if you want to have the fermented tea, which is nothing but a kombucha or say something like kefir or something like, you know, if if we if I have to talk something Indian based, then we can go for something like fermented rice porridge. The rice, you just have to fill it in water and keep it overnight. And in the morning, it's all fermented and you can have this as a porridge in the morning. So this is one of the fermented food product that you can include. But remember, uh, idli and dosa is also a fermented food product, but you're cooking it actually. So when you cook it, actually, you're killing those live beneficial bacteria. And that's not going to give you a lot of benefit of the pro being uh, uh, food being probiotic. So something like, you know, yogurt or kombucha or kefir or fermented rice porridge. So these are like few foods that you can include in your diet in order to improve the count of the beneficial bacteria in your gut. Uh, so that and uh, the next point is the prebiotic, which is nothing but the fiber that we usually eat um, in our food. For example, the fiber from the pomegranate or garlic, asparagus, um, or uh, this, uh, the leeks, etc. So these are like few of the uh, foods that uh, acts as the food for the bacteria or the beneficial bacteria that is present in your gut. So, and also make sure apart from these two foods, you need to make sure that you're taking good amount of liquids or water throughout the day as well. So that'll, uh, so these three things, the probiotic foods, the prebiotic and the uh, good amount of liquids throughout the day will help in maintaining a very good gut health. And if your gut is good, as Samara was saying, your overall uh, health and including your mental well-being uh, will be uh, better. I also want to add over here, uh, as probiotics is a, a live bacteria, they're living. So they also need food. So that is the prebiotic. A prebiotic is the food for the probiotic. So you, we always tend to forget the prebiotic part of it. But, uh, you know, to be honest, if you don't food, give the food to the bacteria, they're going to die out. So uh, even garlic, onions, all, all of those are very good prebiotics. Um, also, one more thing is, yes, we Indians have a lot of dahi in our, in our food. Um, but of course, we refrigerate and have it. The best time to have dahi, if you have a bad digestion or, uh, you know, uh, disturbances in your digestive system, is as soon as you, uh, you know, ferment the dahi before you put it into the fridge, because even that excessive temperature or cold temperature can also kill a few bacteria. So, you know, when it's still uh, just uh, tepid in temperature and, and uh, slightly warmish, that is the time when it's infused with good bacteria. So to have a bowl of it, um, it's not the tastiest because we're not used to having it at that room temperature, but it's really, really good for the gut. I also urge everyone that, so we are not big proponents of supplements. Uh, we feel that your food, especially good sources of uh, fruits and vegetables can can is your right food. You don't need a supplement unless you're extremely deficient in something. But I do definitely condone a good probiotic supplement. Um, if you have and been, and been having issues with your gut for a while, uh, and you're taking these foods, then uh, definitely have a probiotic supplement. It will do no harm. It will only help you. And kombucha, like uh, Nikad said, there are, I, I think, majority of people over here are from Bangalore. Uh, there are some very, very good uh, places in Bangalore. If I'm not mistaken, there's something called Flying Kombucha that offers very good. You can just get in touch with them and buy the bottles. Uh, you can make kombucha, uh, sorry, you can make uh, uh, fermented vegetables at home, like sauerkraut and things like that. Um, so these, these things are very easily available. They sound all fancy, but they're very easily available. If you start making a conscious effort to add these things into your diet, um, you know, having um, charge, uh, having the tepid kind of yogurt, um, having kombucha once in a while, eating a little bit of sauerkraut every day, I can guarantee your gut health will improve tremendously and uh, so will your immune system. And this is something that we have noticed with every one of our clients, we have seen the results. So oh, yes, and oh, we can guarantee you that it really works out. Uh, so yes, and then the immune, this is one of the immune boosting recipe that you can uh, try at home and uh, everyone must have 
eaten this or uh, we have made this uh, at some or one point of time in our lives. That is nothing but the tomato garlic chutney. So the tomatoes are a very good source of lycopene, uh, which is a very good uh, antioxidant and the same time helps in fighting against cancer. And as I was talking about garlic as well previously, uh, it also has a sulfur compounds present in it that helps in improving your immunity. So yes, but then when it comes to tomato, I do want to tell you that uh, the lycopene, it gets activated only when you cook the tomatoes. So uh, simply just eating a lot of raw tomatoes might not benefit you as much as when you cook and take it. Um, uh, you don't have to overcook it, but yes, a little roasting might do the trick. So yes, uh, this is one of the recipes and maybe you could guys include this more often in your diet. So you can just take a picture of this. Um, like Nikhil earlier said, we also have a lot of uh, immunity boosting recipes. We really like to give things that are very easy to make at home, not these fancy kind of recipes, which you can very easily put together in a blender, in a kadai, put it and, and have it with, you know, whether it's with your idli or dosa or, you know, whatever other food that you're eating during the day, which can really add that beneficial factor to, um, to your nutritional uh, content. Got it. So I'm going to keep on picking up some of the relevant questions. The rest of the questions we'll take towards the end. So there's one question about uh, a lot of people nowadays having B12 and uh, vitamin D deficiency, right? And I think at least one of those vitamins, I think, gets synthesized or made bioavailable in the gut, right? By bacteria and stuff like that. So how does one ensure that uh, one is, is there a way to not have supplements or those injections, etc., for these common two vitamin deficiencies? Yes. Now, vitamin B12, as you said, is, yes, synthesized by the gut microbiome in our uh, body. So, yes, we need to make sure or ensure that we are having a good amount of live bacteria or fermented foods on a regular basis. And at the same time, apart from vitamin B12, they also help in making vitamin K in our uh, gut. So, apart from vitamin B12. So, in order for us to avoid having supplements, we need to make sure things like eggs, Okay, or things like, you know, yogurt or curd. So this is where, again, the yogurt or the fermented food product comes into play because this is also a very good source of vitamin B12 because the live bacteria that is actually present in the yogurt or the curd, it has already formed the vitamin B12. So that is why the curd or the yogurt is a very good source of um, vitamin B12. Or say something like, you know, if you have to go for something like eggs or uh, say something like sometimes even fermented cheese is also a very good source of vitamin B12. Or say, if you want to go for something like organic chicken or, or organic fish. So you do include these on and off on a regular basis in your diet. Your vitamin B12 will be on the par. A lot of people also, um, yeah, a lot of people who are uh, you know, very stringent with being vegan. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, will have to pick, pick a B12 supplement. Uh, these are times where, uh, you know, uh, they will be a slightly deficient in a B12 and will probably need to take the supplement. But if you are going to be a little bit open about having uh, certain types of food, then uh, you can take, uh, you know, uh, certain foods that Nikhil had just mentioned. Um, but it's, it's fine. Like a vitamin, vitamin B12 is not going to do any harm if you're deficient in it. It's better to take it. Uh, vitamin D is a very important supplement. We see a lot of cancer patients deficient in vitamin D and we all feel like we get a lot of vitamin D, but a lot of us are deficient in vitamin D um, uh, because we just don't have exposure to sun. Uh, you know, even though we live in a country where we, uh, you know, have a lot of sun, where do we step out and actually spend time in the sun, actually soak in the sun? We don't. And we do use, you know, a lot of sunscreen. So uh, if you can step out in the sun, say, you know, before 9 a.m., even 8.30, I would bring it to, uh, and for about 10 minutes, it's a fantastic way of getting vitamin D into the system. Um, and then avoiding it in peak hours, obviously, of the day. Um, but yeah, vitamin D, again, if you're deficient, it's okay to take it for a small amount of time to just bring your levels back up. The best way of vitamin D is, is sun exposure. There is no other way of doing it, but, but the right sun exposure for the right amount of time. Um, so before 9 or 8.30 in the morning would be the best time. Okay, one related question. Uh, uh, for example, B12, I think a lot of dairy products have uh, B12 in that, right? But yes. uh, uh, somebody is asking a question that some sources say that cancer patients uh, should avoid dairy since it contains growth hormones which can support cancer growth. So what's your take on that? So we're going to spend a little bit time on this, Shining, because this is a question that we get on a regular. 
uh, this is a very very uh, important question as well because uh, we are we are ourselves have seen a lot of research in this and we came in with a certain perspective personally me actually i used to be vegan for many years and i've changed tremendously now but uh, so i came in with a certain perspective on dairy and then learned through science and through real world exposure what's ha actually happening with dairy so i'm we're going to wait uh, that if that's okay and discuss dairy in more detail later okay okay cool yeah? let's move on yeah Right, Nikhil, you can take it forward. Yes. So um, now all of us can do cancer prevention or practice cancer prevention uh, at home itself, and we don't have to go out, uh, go out anywhere else looking for the same. So we are going to tell you uh, how to bring about few changes in your kitchen or restocking your kitchen in order to prevent the cancer. So the very first food that we would recommend you to use is the pure ghee or the pure organic ghee. Okay, now uh, ghee is a very good source of vitamin A, E, and to some extent it does have vitamin D as well in it. And uh, it is very good source of omega-3, which is again uh, essential for our brain and heart health and skin and our joints. And it's a good source of energy and it can tolerate high temperature cooking as well. So in case you have, if you have been using um, refined oils uh, on a regular basis for the cooking, uh, I would urge you to uh, use start using ghee for all your uh, simple cooking, uh, because this is a better option when compared to the refined oils that you that we usually end up using on a regular basis. The next food is um, oils. Yes. Now, uh, when you go to any supermarket, uh, you see a lot of oils on the um, uh, placed on the shelf as you walk down the aisle. So, I would, and they they actually claim to be very um, super healthy and good for your uh, health. But I would say they're not really, uh, they are not what they really claim to be because they're extracted at very high temperatures. Now, the, the, when they are extracted at the very high temperature, it's like the oil has already reached the smoking point. I'll tell you what is what the smoking point is. Now, uh, if you have seen all these um, hot chip shops in Bangalore or, or anywhere else or like, you know, in any other place, uh, they use the same oil again and again and again and you can see the smoke coming out of it so that is nothing but the smoking point and when you see the smoke coming out of it that means the oil has started to undergo degradation and there is oxidation taking place and there are free radicals generated there so you know, therefore you will have to be uh, really careful and that is what uh, happens when they are extracting refined oils out of the seeds. They are treated at very high temperature. So and the oil must have already reached the smoking point. And in order to bring down the smoking point, they are treated with many more chemicals as such. So you'll have to be really careful. And the seeds used are, are not, could not be of a very high quality or they could be of a mixed mixed quality and the oil extracted um, uh, might not have the nutrients that originally the seeds have in them or it might uh, and also in order to remove the aroma or the flavor of the original oil uh, what happens is they again treat with the chemicals in order to uh, bring the flavor down or uh, the, the smell of it and then shelf life is much better of the refined oils because again they are treated with some kind of artificial uh, chemicals. So that is why I would ask you not to take refined oils, but rather you would use something like ghee or cold pressed oils. Because cold pressed oils can be extracted without using any heat, or they're done at a very high or sorry low temperature. And the uh, the oil that you extract from the cold pressed oils is actually retains the flavor or the aroma of the original seed. Not only that, but it also retains the nutrients or the vitamins that you actually get from the original seed. And the shelf life is actually a low of these cold pressed oils because, of course, they're not treated with any kind of uh, preservatives. So starting from today, in case if you guys have been using refined oils, uh, please make sure you either switch to ghee or something like cold pressed oil. And if I have to give you a few examples, you can go for something like cold pressed coconut oil or, uh, or extra virgin olive oil or um, uh, extra virgin avocado oil. Something like this, because these oils, uh, they have high smoking points. So tomorrow in the future, in case, even if you do end up uh, frying, um, sometimes it's uh, okay. But uh, yes, something like, you know, when you're doing shallow frying or something, you can go for the oils that I just mentioned, rather than using any kind of refined oil. 
So, uh, wanted to add one quick uh, point about refined oils. So, the other thing is most refined oils are actually a mix of various different types of oils, right, from different seeds. And one of the things that happens, unfortunately, in India, so uh, uh, a lot of that oil is actually cottonseed oil, right? Now, uh, yes. in general, in India, GMO has not entered overall, right? Uh, but cotton is something where GMO is allowed by the government, right? And it's very prevalent there. So unfortunately, a lot of the refined oil finally has uh, uh, GMO in it. Uh, so that's something that most people are not aware of. And you should probably be aware of that because the cottonseed oil is coming from uh, GMO cotton mostly. Okay, so the next one is... Uh, uh, is it advisable to use olive oil for cooking? Yes, it is. Yes, yes very much so. And uh, specifically extra virgin olive oil. Also, always buy your oil in a glass bottle. The darker the glass, the better it is. Uh, because I think oil exposure to sun, correct me if I'm wrong, oxidizes very quickly. So whenever you go in and you uh, buy your oil, essentially, and, and, and this is not to say that the oils that we're mentioning are not a little bit more expensive. Yes, they are. But trust me, it is the best expense for your health. Uh, the first things that we do for all our cancer patients, whether it is those who are going through treatment, those who are post-treatment, or even if they're looking at cancer prevention, the first thing we do is change their oil and salt. First thing. So your oil and salt is the most thing because it's, it's, it's going into everything. So spend that extra money if you have to, but get good oil that you consume. Um, so extra virgin olive oil is very good. Uh, if you're deep frying, which I mean, uh, like really deep frying food, then, uh, you know, uh, you can use things like, um, you know, avocado oil or coconut oil. Uh, but extra virgin olive oil is great for, so there's this uh, misconception that extra virgin olive oil is only good for salads. It's not. It's good for good uh, for Indian cooking as well. It doesn't get rancid or oxidized too quickly. Uh, it's very pure, good source of omega-3 and um, please buy the oil in a glass bottle the darker the bottle the better it is yeah okay so the next one is the salt now uh, the table salt that we usually um, use these days or uh, that is available these days is mostly uh, contaminated and impure and it, it uh, because they're again treated because it's the original salt that you get it is uh, undergoes refining and bleaching. Again, the chemicals are used in order to refine or bleach the salt that you usually get. So in order of we, for us to get the best out of the salt, it's better we would use something like rock salt or Himalayan salt or pink salt uh, because mm -hmm. it's refined and it contains more nutrients uh, uh, naturally present in it. And the color uh, you see, the pink, is uh, due to presence of iron naturally in it. So, like, you know, pink salt has, like, over about 18 or more uh, vitamins or nu yeah. nutrients present in it. Uh, so, although in very small portion size, but still, this is something that is not really refined or which is available uh, naturally and it's pure. So, uh, this is a better option and you could use this when compared to the white or the table salt unless you're suffering from iodine deficiency um, because the white salt is fortified with iodine. So, yeah, that is uh, the salt. When it comes to salt, please go for rock salt or the pink salt. Uh, do you have any brand recommendation uh, because about the pink salt? Try to get organic. Uh, if you have a nature's basket, you will see a company, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Conscious Foods. That's a good uh, brand to get your pink salt from. But anywhere where it's 100% certified organic, pink salt that's your best source of uh, of pink salt okay on a related note is it okay to add salt while cooking or only after that is there any difference or no there's absolutely no difference okay and a good brand of olive oil a good brand of olive oil again um if I'm not mistaken, as Borges, if I'm not mistaken, but I will yeah, get that is Borges is the one that I personally use. Uh, again, just make sure you get something that is 100% certified organic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, uh, does Himalayan pink salt contain iodine in it? No. 
No, Himalayan pink salt doesn't really have iodine in it. That is why I was saying, unless you have iodine deficiency, it's better you would use pink salt. Otherwise, a white or the table salt is fortified with iodine, actually. So you can go for the white salt. Or otherwise, in case if you don't want to use a table salt for iodine, there are other foods as well that are very good source of iodine. For example, egg, egg yolk. Egg yolk is a good source of iodine. Fish, fish is a very good source of iodine. So unless you have iodine deficiency, uh, I would ask you to go for pink salt. Okay, Thank since you're also you. mentioning okay. organic in a bunch of places, Nikhil has a question. In your experience, have you established a connection between chemical fertilizers and pesticides used in almost all of our foods these days with cancer? I mean, uh, are there like reports? Is it something that you validated with your experience or uh, is there any data supporting that? So I will answer that and then Nick, if you can take it forward. So that's a really good question. Uh, there is no conclusive evidence saying that, you know, GMO fertilized foods uh, are, uh, you know, is, is there is a direct link to cancer. Uh, what there is a lot of evidence that's uh, saying that these kind of fertilizers, pesticides are actually affecting the gut microbiome in the in the digestive system, which can then eventually affect your immune system and then lead to different uh, issues. Um, but this is again that uh, is very good or bad for you kind of uh, you know debate. Um, but if you can afford to not have the fertilizers and the pesticides, and you can afford to have complete organic. Now I don't. Uh, we don't condone 100% organic with everything. Um, we condone 100% uh, uh, organic with a few things that become, uh, you know, uh, regulars in your food. So like your oil, your salt, maybe your grains to a certain degree because you're consuming it very regularly. Certain fruits and certain vegetables. Um, it's, it's, it's not even possible to go 100% organic and live that way. If you can, fantastic. Um, but... But uh, uh, consuming a bit of, uh, you know, foods that are not organic is per per perfectly fine. There is no conclusive evidence that is saying that it definitely leads to this type of cancer, but it definitely does disrupt certain, uh, you know, issues in the immune, uh, in your digestive system, for sure. Got it. Cool. Let's move on. Yes. So the next one is eggs. So it's a very good source of vitamin uh, A, D, E, K, and other minerals as well, like zinc and calcium and magnesium. And uh, it's also a very good source of omega-3 fat, good source of protein, and it's got all nine essential amino acids in it. So you all must have heard the saying that says, Sunday ho ya Monday, rose khao ande. So that is actually true. You can have eggs on a regular basis and you can include it um, uh, every day. You can have about maybe like uh, one or two eggs on a regular basis. Now, again, it's something personalized to everyone. And um, uh, yes, so please go ahead and include this on a regular basis because as I said, it's a very good source of, it's like a almost complete food for you for one to include on a regular basis. And at the same time, especially if you're diabetic, it's also very uh, low in carbs. Uh, one egg gives like almost one gram of carbs, which is almost negligible. And it's low in glycemic index as well. So include eggs on a regular basis in your diet. It's very, And also when we say include eggs, we also mean the yolk. Uh, unfortunately, the yolk has got a lot of negative, uh, uh, you know, just just the thought of a yolk everyone thinks it's fattening it's high in cholesterol see cholesterol is not bad it, like Nikot had rightly said earlier cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease it's it's other issues that got, causes heart disease and doesn't allow the cholesterol to flow through so that's a whole other conversation but um, the the entire egg is a complete food and you have in fact more protein in the yolk than you even have in the egg, in the white of the egg so when you're eating an egg feel free to eat, eat the whole egg it's the best um, uh, complete food that you can get Mamini no, substitute for vegetarians months yeah, Nikat, you, you get this a lot. So any substitute? Well, it is it. not like a perfect substitute for vegetarians um, uh, if you have to compare egg and any other vegetarian food. Uh, so if you're a pure vegetarian, then of course you'll have to rely on foods like nuts and seeds and uh, pulses and legumes. So, But you'll have to make sure that you're including these uh, in terms of variety. 
Okay, now for example, if today if you have included tur dal, then tomorrow you might have to include chana dal, and day after tur tur dal. So just keep changing your dals on a regular basis so that you get all nine essential amino acids. But apart from that, uh, the other thing is in case if you're diabetic or uh, trying to lose weight, uh, the pulses and legumes are also very good source of carbs. So in case if that is something that you're uh, trying to block, then it's one of the disadvantage that you get from pulses and legumes. Or apart from that, uh, there's the other foods as well that you can include, like soy bean. Uh, it is said to have all uh, nine essential amino acids in it. Or say something like quinoa is again good in protein at the same time has all nine essential amino acids in it. So maybe something like this you can go ahead. But what happens with veg food is it's got this phytic acid present in it. So the absorption is not that really great uh, when compared to your eggs or fish or chicken. So you you might have to you know cook it. Yes, the cooking actually brings down the level of phytic acid. Uh, but still, if uh, if I have to tell you, then egg uh, there's no particular perfect substitute for egg as such. But then yes, the more the variety that you include in your diet in terms of nuts and seeds and pulses and legumes, you'll be able to meet the requirement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is just coming into dairy. This is a conversation. So there's this. This is a conversation that's really never ending. Um, so I'm going to tell you uh, personally my story with dairy because it's I've had my own personal relationship with it. So the thing is that um, I was one of those uh, Punjabi kids that were was brought up with a lot of milk and uh, meat and all of that, and uh, you know would drink. tons of milk per day the holics the glass of milk you know that was our staple uh, before school after school during school all the time and um, then there we you know i entered this world of oh my god dairy is not good for you and veganism and uh, you know non dairy this non dairy that and i started making myself believe that i was lactose intolerant that dairy is bad i also read uh, the book where maybe someone some of you guys have read which is the china study and that really really uh, completely destroys your view on dairy and protein per se and meat and all of that really condones veganism for cancer and that sealed the deal for me and i was like no dairy definitely not um which was not that difficult for me to do because i was living in the us then and at that point there were a lot of non dairy substitutes over there uh, today it's very different in india here we now have almond milk soy milk oat milk rice milk uh, cashew milk anything that we want but at that time there really wasn't so when i was living in the us it was very easy for me to uh, jump on this bandwagon of veganism be this complete vegan person not have dairy wouldn't even have dark chocolate uh not even touch dairy for a very long period of time and uh needless to say i definitely saw improvements in a lot of things i honestly didn't know what improvement i was looking for but i felt better um you know essentially and then whatever issues uh start, i i started feeling certain issues again with my gut uh you know menstrual cycle uh skin so on and so forth and and i realized that okay fine this dairy thing was a little short lived um however what happened to me is that it kind of made my digestion very very uh you know weak to dairy so when i started having dairy again i became i actually felt like i created an intolerance for myself when i never had one previously um when i moved back to the to india and when of course we started the company and we started working with cancer patients uh i came with my personal a uh, you know perspective of not giving dairy to cancer patients because there is this evidence that saying that you know dairy has this casein in it that casein is kind of you know is it increases the growth hormone uh, i mean growth um, of cancer cells and so on and so forth and it progresses cancer in the body so i came with this personal uh, uh, perspective but uh, honestly i am not a clinical nutritionist i do i have trained in nutrition but uh i i'm not medically trained to work with cancer patients and so we got a team of very very specialized clinical nutritionists who sat across me and said that it it isn't so and uh, i fought the fight for a long time until i was proven wrong that what the 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 truth of the matter is that dairy is not bad um you know dairy is not bad for you the only thing about dairy is that um it is the source of where you get dairy i started seeing patients personally who were not on dairy uh, start taking certain levels of dairy and improving tremendously with their nutrition with their weight with different parameters and they just were changing with the way they were so 
And so dairy per se is not bad. Uh, so consuming dairy is perfectly fine. It is the source of where you get the dairy. That is the answer to everything is where are you getting this dairy from? And that's where the biggest issue lies today. Um, dairy is, uh, unless you're lactose intolerance, unless you do have a certain condition where you cannot consume dairy, then of course dairy is not okay for you. Um, but if you're okay and you've been consuming dairy, I, it is something that... Uh, uh, and, and say you have other issues, like say you have high uh, levels of allergy, like you're very, very prone to allergy or you have skin issues. I would recommend getting off dairy for a little while or I would first recommend maybe seeing where your dairy source is. If you're getting it from really good, uh, you know, uh, good breed of cows in a proper place where, you know, they, they're not injecting the cows with hormones and uh, growth hormones and antibiotics um, and you're getting pure organic dairy but you're still having a lot of allergy and skin issues, then I would suggest then getting off dairy for a bit because it might be some condition with the gut. Um, but dairy per se is not really bad for you. Uh, Nikhil, do you, do you have anything to say about dairy? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I'm JNT. Actually, I want to ask this. Uh, uh, Indians used to tell that using turmeric uh, milk is very good for prevention of any this thing, right? Turmeric. Yes. Yeah, you think yes. so dairy, you are like yes. uh, telling about the dairy. Dairy means like it includes milk, right? So there is milk. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what using turmeric milk will uh, prevent most of the things, right? How it uh, like uh, with relate with this cancer, like uh, drinking or giving turmeric milk, like. Hello. Okay, so basically where this has come from and that's why, yes, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. Hello. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so basically where from is, uh, I think that we should really listen to our ancestors and listen to the way they used to eat. So we do before you sleep is something that a lot of our grandparents used to do and i'll tell you so uh, haldi is basically turmeric or uh, a component yeah. of turmeric is curcumin now okay. this, this curcumin um, has very high anti uh, inflammatory properly the inflammation it decreases inflammation in the body which they're saying is one of the factors that gets so so there's a lot of study behind curcumin and that's why curcumin has become a very big thing where it's now the nutritional supplements, there's this, there's that. Um, mm. Because they, they have found this thing that can decrease inflammation in the body. Now, what I want to add to this is like Nikhat says, eat haldi and think, like I know a lot of people who take water and mix haldi in it and drink it and they think they're getting the inflammatory properties. No, you're not. Because haldi is a component, is a uh, is a type of an it where you have to mix it with a fat. So you have to mix it with um, oil or some kind of fat uh, to actually increase the absorption of the into your digestive system. That's why eating haldi by itself or just with water is not going to absorb it. But when you have haldi with milk, because there's a high level of fat in absorbs very well there is a 20 uh, uh, 20x uh, you know rate of haldi with a certain fat so if you have it with coconut oil you have it with avocado cheese you have it with milk it is going to absorb the other components of haldi the good absorb 20 times higher so that's why they say mix haldi with milk so the absorbed haldi is higher. The, uh, the haldi is very good in terms of bringing down inflammation in the body. Now, what ancestors, why did our grandparents have it before sleeping? This is the really interesting part. Um, they think because milk has something called tryptophan in it. And this is, a, this is a component that really helps you sleep, actually. So it makes you sleepy. So having haldi dude in the night, sleeping was a very good anti-inflammatory drink uh, which also helps you sleep well so something that you can very well have uh, before going to sleep at night yeah okay yeah yeah um i also want to mention this one thing about curcumin because this is also another thing that has become a big fad of 
eating uh, you know having these curcumin supplements and curcumin is everywhere um while yes there is a lot of evidence supporting that it brings on inflammation it is not the cure to cancer or it is not that if you have so much curcumin in your system every day that you'll definitely not get cancer please understand getting cancers is a result of many things many components so if you're going to have 20 supplements of curcumin and this supplement that supplement but not you know exercise and eat unhealthy and have a very stressful life and live in a really highly polluted environment then the other factors are going to overcompensate so the the nutrition industry per se has made this curcumin the next big thing and it's a little bit of a money making racket um have the curcumin at home you you have you know access to good organic turmeric take that put it in a little bit of coconut oil put it in some of your food uh, put it in a glass of milk drink it like that that's good enough you know uh, you really don't have to have curcumin supplements and think that you're preventing cancer that's not really what's happening okay uh, one hi samara uh, we have uh, 20 minutes left by the way mm-hmm. hi, so- hi samara i hi. I wanted to ask, how is gluten connected to cancer? Is uh, uh, specifically breast cancer? So I've been on sure. a uh, gluten. I've been on gluten throughout my life and was detected with breast cancer. And then now I'm doing a diet in which they say to be off gluten free. So, but in my life I've never had ragi, baja, jowar, nor do I digest it well. What is the connection? And, and if I Google it, it says that there is no connection between gluten-free and cancer. So, uh, you know, should I change my lifestyle totally and be on a gluten-free diet throughout my life now? Okay, being so on uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so that takes us to our sixth point, which is grains. Uh, we essentially take all our patients uh, during treatment, post-treatment off gluten. Um, I personally don't eat gluten and that's not because there is a direct correlation towards cancer. It's because again, it goes through your gut. Again, gluten causes a lot of disturbances in the, in the digestion and in your gut microbiome. And when that happens, it affects immunity. It affects, uh, you know, even excretion and, and release of toxins. And that's why they say that it's better not to have gluten. Um, the worst form of gluten is wheat. Uh, which we are consuming every day from morning to night uh, because it's the cheapest so- source that is out there and the best marketed. Uh, but wheat is the most modern crop there is and it has the highest level of gluten. So we always encourage our patients and people to have grains that are more um, regional grains. So, you know, like uh, ragi, bajra, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Because we'll give you your grains. Um, correlation between gluten and cancer there is a correlation between gluten and the the issue of gut which can then affect different factors which is one of which is your immune system so can be of gluten i would highly suggest for you to do so having it once in a while is perfect to punish yourself but uh, but try to keep off gluten uh, especially if you have cancer and you're the remission phase, um, it's important for you to keep off gluten. But Nikat will expand more on this because she, with a lot of breast cancer patients, and I mean, the majority of our patients are breast cancer. So very uh, good diets that have really seen some phenomenal improvements in their medical reports, biochemical markers, and recovery. Thank you. Yeah, Nikit, you uh, also, you know, this prolonged and intensive breeding of wheat as these has produced varieties which was um, which is actually unrecognizable to our ancestors. So the kind of wheat that our ancestors used to, used to eat back then is was different when uh, compared to the wheat that we are consuming these days right now. And if you see actually the wheat that is produced these days is resistant to drought at best due to use of a lot of chemicals as well. And it is uh, easy to harvest at the same time. So that is why the wheat has become uh, the modern crop, uh, crop, as Samara was saying, and it is also famous at the same time. And because it is biologically manipulated as well these days, the wheat has more amount of gluten when compared to the amount of gluten uh, that it used to be previously, or naturally it used to be present. So that is why, yes, the better options are the millets because they're least allergenic and the, they are good source of fiber, manganese, magnesium, iron, vitamin B, etc. And this gluten, if you're going to eat a lot, then yes, it can create a havoc uh, in your digestive system. 
And because your digestive system is directly related to immune system, that is how it might be correlated. Um, and that is why maybe your dietitian or, or the doctor has asked you to avoid gluten. But there's no like direct correlation. Or, or, also, yes. Direct correlation. I also want to add one more thing is a lot of people are going gluten free and then they have gluten free pasta, they have friata, they have gluten free this. Please don't do that because the gluten-free substitute is probably worse than that. Because to make a gluten-free substitute, you are adding a lot of other different additives. Uh, additives. So you know, that soy lecithin or whatever it is, which is worse on your gut. So this whole gluten-free thing or gluten-free gluten-free rice, uh, well, rice and doesn't have gluten, but gluten-free pasta I'm seeing, don't have it. You rather have a grain that has gluten in it. You know, maybe like quinoa, maybe like amaranth, uh, which is gluten-free and millet. Sure, uh, Nick had said. So yes, try to avoid gluten as much as possible. Try and eat uh, different types of grains. Wheat is really not the best. So don't have that on a regular. Um, and uh, there are many more grains out there that you can opt for than just wheat. Yes, but just make sure even if you do eat gluten or wheat tomorrow, uh, do not eat like for every meal of yours and every day. Let there be variety in your diet so that one particular food uh, shouldn't have that kind of impact on your health. Yeah, so Nika, do you want to just quickly go through the next few slides? We don't have much time. Yes. So the next one is uh, uh, the farming and soil. So Shamik would be knowing uh, better about this. So yes, so the role of soil uh, uh, in our health. So we know that soil is most important natural resource and um, it, it helps in the growth of plants and trees for us. And not only that, but it also has good microbiome present in the soil uh, that helps in nitrogen fixation. So uh, due to, but uh, these days what has happened is uh, due to population growth or food insecurities and agricultural intensification, use a lot of pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers, the micro, uh, uh, microbes, the beneficial microbes that are present in the soil are getting destroyed. Uh, and the soil erosion that takes place and uh, the quality of the soil is getting degraded. And uh, that is how uh, the, the food that we are eating these days is not as nutrient dense as it used to be uh, very long back. So that's where um, uh, the organic farming comes into uh, play. Uh, am I right, Shami? Yeah, there's one more uh, angle to it. So one is, of course, the fact that there are a lot more beneficial bacteria and things like that. The second interesting angle is that uh, if you look at how uh, conventional farming, you grow your stuff, right? In conventional farming, you add whatever the plant needs, right? So you, uh, you know, you put in a spray to fight a disease or a pest, etc. Right? Now, yes. what happens in organic farming is that the plant is actually left to itself to fend against those insects, against various diseases. And while doing that, it produces a lot of phytochemicals, right? To kind of prevent those things from uh, uh, harming the plant. And these phytochemicals finally add a lot of the nutrition or the nutrients to that uh, uh, to that plant, right? So the plant is actually healthier to eat because it has gone ahead and produced chemicals, right, to repel those pests and stuff like that, right? So I think that whole part gets completely missed when you try to go uh, grow food in conventional methods or in things like hydroponics, etc. Because what happens is that the plant is not producing many of those uh, compounds, which it's producing for its own sake to get rid of diseases and pests, but which are actually beneficial for us. Mm. And yeah, also, and I think that's yeah. why uh, I think that's why uh, one of the most important things and the reason that even, uh, you know, we do get called to a lot of uh, you know, talks and things like that. But one of the things that really attracted us to what you guys are doing is, is essentially this, because we know that, that eating the right foods is good, but where you get the food from is the most essential part. And that's what we're trying to encourage everyone to push towards is that please see where you're getting from and once you have a direct you know correlation to where you're getting your food from what you know as long as it's 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 more plant-based and healthy for you you're you're in, it's very very important so the next one is uh, skincare uh, so our skin, uh, as you know, is the largest organ that absorbs whatever you might put on it. So therefore, it's very important uh, that we use the right kind of skincare these days. 
Now, uh, the skincare that is available these days has a lot of impurities or toxins or chemicals present in it. So the next slide that we are moving to uh, will tell you uh, everything about uh, these um, uh, uh, chemicals or the yes, uh, sulfates, parabens and phthalates. Uh, PCBs and all of these. Now, especially if you're estrogen sensitive. Now, say, for example, a lot of my patients who get diagnosed with breast cancer are estrogen sensitive. Now, things like, you know, sulfate, parabens, phthalates, and PCBs, they, these are called as xenoestrogens. So that means it um, you know, helps in production of more estrogen in the body. And because you're already sensitive to estrogen, this might have a negative impact on it. So I would urge you guys to go for clean skincare products um, uh, which is like, you know, Pahari Local or uh, Tinge or Juicy Chemistry, which, do, which basically use all these natural food items uh, to make uh, uh, these um, uh, skincare products. For example, say if you want to try something like, you know, a compact oh, or this. foundation or a lipstick, so go for something like Tinge, because if you go on their website and check, they, they use all of these um, uh, pure extracts from the foods, for example, uh, the pomegranate, the color from the pomegranate. So these are the few uh, brands that you can rely on. And we actually recommend these to our patients as well. Can go on our website which is careoforcancer.com you'll see it at the end and there are some brands over there uh, you can just buy their products from there we the reason we put this in here is also because skin is an important part and you know all of us even including uh, men are you know using different brands seeing that it's loaded with chemicals so this is another layer of complication we're putting over there so let you know uh, brands and uh, you know, those that are, are chemical free is the best. What's your opinion on it's very uh, quickly, you know, we in want... kind of going back to uh, uh, like our uh, grandmoms, etc. They used to make a lot of skincare stuff at home, right? From different ingredients and stuff like that. What's your take on that? That probably is maybe the safest way, right? Because you are making your own stuff. So, so Shabik, these brands basically have just taken that and just put some really good branding and that's about it, you okay. know? Uh, it, use that. I, I used to use a lot of cold pressed coconut oil on my face. Um, uh, pomegranate seed oil is very good for skin. Um, you know, jojoba oil is very good. Almond oil is very good for your hair. Avocado oil is good for your hair. So, you know, if you have the patience and you, you, you can make it at home, please do that. Please do that. That's the best. Source. But again, cold pressed oils then is what you need to look for. And, and organic uh, so if you're using oatmeal or honey or something to make a face fat, then organic is best. Yes. We'll quickly go over vaccines and, uh, and screening for cancer prevention because it's something you need to keep in mind. But let's just do this really quickly. Now, these are a few of the vaccines that are available uh, that can help in preventing uh, specific types of cancer. For example, HPV is nothing but the human papilloma virus. Uh, so this vaccine specifically helps in uh, preventing cervical cancer. And uh, hepatitis B uh, vaccine, uh, is it helps in uh, preventing liver cancer. So yes, these are like the only two vaccines currently available. And the vaccine, they're like available in all the hospitals as well, in case if you do consider taking those. Now, the next one is the cancer screening. Now, why is it important? Is because it improves your chances of finding the cancer early. So when no, it has done like minimal damage to your body and it can be treated easily. So therefore cancer screening, um, different cancer screening uh, tests are available these days. So for colon cancer, it is a colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy or high sensitivity or fecal local blood test. Or if you want to get yourself tested for lung cancer, then there's low dose helical computer tomography or breast cancer mammography or uh, something like you know pap test for your cervical cancer or ca 125 test is a blood test and then psa test is for your prostate cancer not only these but yes uh, uh, in case if you do want to test uh, yourself or uh, keep a check on yourself then there's something called a self breast exam uh, so uh, yes wherein uh, you know you just uh, lift your hands and then feel your breast rotate uh, with these three fingers and feel if there's any lump or uh, as such. Uh, and then skin exam, yes, keep an eye on your uh, entire body, uh, back and uh, everywhere. And then oral cancer, if you do want to see, just keep a, keep a check on your uh, oral health. 
So these are few things that you can also do apart from uh, getting yourself uh, uh, and getting yourself tested going to the hospital. I do want to say a recommended away. frequency or anything like that for for these sort of tests or yes yes there is so example like a cervical uh, um, uh, sorry so yeah so so for like a cervical test um, which is a pap smear yeah so for the pap smear I think it's about once in two or three years because it's a little bit of an intrusive test a self examination for all women on how to do a self test examination. Uh, you should be doing it once a month, uh, post your uh, mental cycle, uh, the, that every month you should be doing mm, a CA one to five or um, annual health checkup that you can do. A PSA test comes in later it's for it's, uh, prostate cancer. A colonoscopy is one where if you have had history of colon cancer, then we would urge you to do it. Uh, regularly, the doctors will tell you how often it would annually. Um, a mammogram comes in post 45 years, and again, I think that's an annual, but it really depends on if there's a family history and then how often you need to do it. Um, many examinations have some of these tests in it, so you can do it then. But I do really want to get the fact that, guys, uh, you know, uh, India unfortunately has a very reactive approach to health fall sick where we want to do everything but we don't we don't have a proactive approach where we want to take these examinations and make sure we're good you know uh, please understand with cancer it is 100% curable if you get it on an early stage you do not have to worry about cancer again but the problem occurs to stage 2 and 3 and 4 and and then it becomes difficult so get it if it's there get it on an early stage if it's like any other illness it's really not that scary but the only way is that you keep doing your exam because you have to be prompt with what's going on. That's very, very important. Yes. Um, okay, so bringing us to the end of uh, this uh, session, like I said earlier, we had we have created this fantastic uh, cancer risk assessment. It's actually two, eight months to create it. And we have some of the biggest doctors who have helped us do this, plus, uh, you know, specialists in the field. Um, this is the closest that you can get to understanding where you are uh, in your system of cancer. And it's not scary because even if you have a high risk of cancer, we will then tell you what exactly you put your risk down. And it's all very simple stuff. It is not complicated stuff. So what we're going to do is, uh, I think, Shami, send out this link to you guys. It's a, a form which is you know free of cost. You can just put in all your answers. They're really easy to answer, basic we it will come directly to our team we will then uh, create, uh, do the results for you we will kind of put it all together and send you back a report you exactly where you lie in your risk of cancer and what's contributing to that higher risk uh, uh, you can get in touch with us you can do a consultation with us and uh, we can then tell you you know what you can do yeah. whether it's your food whether anything to do with your lifestyle get your bring your risk down so that's something that all of you have to do. Even if you go to our website, which um, uh, you can have, you can get uh, access to the link over there. We also have a cancer prevention toolkit. It's a guidebook actually, which we built because we just realized that a lot of people uh, are, are very confused when it comes to cancer prevention. They're very scared of something that is very controllable. You just need to know what you what you have to do. It's su such basic things that you can do that can drastically bring your risk down. So um, we created this guidebook. It's just a fabulous, comprehensive, uh, you know, platform and book of content, actually, where it gives you immunity essential, gives you multiple recipes. It gives you exclusive diet plans for diabetes, hormonal issues, um, gut issues, obesity, uh, COPD. We give you different types of diet plans that you can practice by yourself. We give you access to exercise videos, access to exercise, exercise videos, so that um, so I really urge you to go and have a look at this as well. And uh, please, um, you know, uh, if you're interested in it, you can get in touch with us or you can just purchase the book uh, directly and it will teach you everything you need to know to keep your risks low. Um, these are all, uh, this is all the information that we're going to send to you after the session so you can go and research further. Our website is careoforcancer.com. So even just for you to go and understand what's going on out there for those who have cancer and those who want to prevent it, all the information is there so you can 
have a look at that. Um, have a look and, at that. Yeah. And um, the, the one more thing I do want to mention is that the, the next one more thing I want to mention is we're going to be doing a session for those people who already have cancer or post cancer. And uh, this is where we are going to talk a lot about what you can do to help heal the cancer better. Uh, from a very scientific medical standpoint, we are not in alternative therapies at all. Um, so if you have cancer, you know someone who has cancer, I please urge you to get them to come to the session next weekend because that's our forte. Uh, we are specialized in oncology care. And uh, if you've had cancer, I, I recommend that you join that session next weekend as well. Cool. So I think there are a lot of questions around uh, like how to get in touch with you, etc. So it's there on the screen, guys. Uh, please uh, note down the the coordinates. Do you want to share the uh, the link here in the chat as well? I'm going to send it out in the app also. But uh, yes. maybe you can share that, that. Uh, yes. assessment link in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this. Um, and I will just yeah. send the link. There's one question uh, which I found it very relevant, which other people have also posted. If you have very high allergies, does it mean that you are prone to cancer? Like I get a lot of allergies because of pollen. I get common cold and flu very often. I get skin allergies also very frequent. I also get gut allergies also very frequently. So does it mean that? So it doesn't mean you're prone to cancer. It means that you have uh, some kind of digestive or gut issue that you need to which means that your immunity is also low. Um, so uh, I would if you were to come to us saying that this is, uh, you know, I have these allergies and I have these gut issues, we would first put a location program and that will solve the entire thing for you. Uh, see, the thing is, you're not prone to cancer, prone to uh, a decreased immune system, which can then make you susceptible to a decreased immune but system. But to say that it's yeah, just cancer, that's, uh, that you can't really say that, that it's just cancer. Nika, do you want to add anything to that? You're muted, actually. Ma'am, ma excuse me, ma'am. Yes, sorry for that. Yes, uh, so, but it's better, as Samara said, that you get yourself uh, treated for those uh, allergies. Otherwise, like, you know, you're getting affected with these allergies on and off uh, can decrease your immunity. And... Uh, Yes, so th that is why uh, it's better if you could just uh, get in touch with us and we might be able to help you. And we might be able to help you. I just want to quickly add Thank something. you so much. Then I will, I will get in touch with your organization then for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add something here. Thank you for this session to Samara and Nikar because cancer is such a mysterious concept for most of us uh, sometimes we feel that even though people have made good choices good food choices and healthy lifestyle choices but still they get cancer what is what is the reason and things like that but thank you for putting the session the together so that we like can that, but we can uh, at least session together note together down so the things which can. we can control and uh, you explained it in a very simple terminology which i really appreciate because many of the <laughs> cancer related uh, seminars we attend, the, the terminologies they use are very uh, difficult for common people like us to understand. So thank you for putting this together. And I just want to add, I mean, by the way, this cancer is becoming like a pandemic very soon. I mean, in India, I just think we hardly had any cancer patients in the beginning. Now we are getting 10, 11 lakhs patients every year being added. Yeah. Imagine. I mean, yes, okay. you're absolutely right. And it's the second, it's actually the second leading cause of death worldwide. So it's mainly because of lifestyle related factors. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma yes. Ma'am, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014, 15. I was told not to eat uh, um, uh, soya bean based uh, uh, soya bean in any form uh, so I stopped eating that now I just asked for uh, the substitute for egg right uh, since I'm a vegetarian uh, I'm 
uh, uh, since I'm a, m- m- I was a, I was diagnosed with cancer, I was not supposed to eat uh, soya bean. So, is it okay if I eat uh, uh, soya bean uh, for the substitute of egg, ma'am? Okay. Um, but firstly, what I want to know is if you are estrogen sensitive or not. Estrogen sensitive or not. Uh, I don't know exactly, ma'am, but uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly, ma'am, but eat, uh, 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 soya bean based uh, uh, product. Did you have ERP positive breast cancer? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you are you are estrogen sensitive. Mm. So that's why you were told not to eat soya bean because soya has uh, some amount of estrogen in it. So does dairy. So you should not be having dairy either. Um, uh, what I really suggest uh, is that why don't you get in touch with us? We put the contacts uh, over there. I will put it up in the chat box again. Um, we will just do a consultation with you and tell you exactly what you should be eating. That would be much better because we will need to check a few of your medical reports. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. You're sure. welcome. There were some other uh, questions as well. Uh, I think, yeah, Manasi had a question uh, that is it, I mean, even whole ground wheat with the fiber, not store bought, but milled yourself, is that also as an, I mean, does, is that also a problematic? See, actually, the problem is gluten. It's not store-bought or you milling yourself at home, but it's the gluten. Now, as I said, uh, the kind of wheat that we used to get previously or our ancestors used to eat is different when compared to the wheat that we are eating right now at present. So because it's also biologically uh, manipulated, the gluten content is more compared to what our ancestors used to eat back then. So yes, um, uh, I would ask you not to eat gluten on a regular basis, even if you're not too really sensitive for it. So, but the, let's just uh, make sure that there's variety in your diet. Don't just rely on the gluten because, or the wheat basically, because it, it's got like a lot of gluten these days. So let there be variety in your diet and eat different types of whole grains rather than just relying on wheat. There was uh, another question earlier about uh, intermittent fasting and uh, does that actually help in healing? Is it positive? Is it negative from a cancer prevention as well as care perspective? I think Nikhat and I are the biggest proponents of intermittent fasting because there's a lot of science and research behind this. See, we've we've seen nutrition and diets and all of that is a constant. So nutrition is an ever-evolving field. And then in that comes multiple different fads, um, you know, the alkaline diet, the ketogenic diet, this diet, that diet, uh, you know, we've seen it all and we always go by uh, research and science and, and what works, uh, not negating ketogenesis and how that, that is beneficial, great for brain tumor, patients, certain kinds of patients. Uh, but intermittent fasting is gaining a lot of momentum because there's a lot of research that um, it's it's great in keeping inflammation low, and maybe Nikhat can tell, tell why intermittent fasting is very helpful. Um, if you do want to get on an intermittent diet, you need with us, and we will tell you how to do that. You can't just suddenly start fasting. You there is a way of weaning to an intermediate plan, and then weaning yourself out and 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 making it a part of life. We don't believe in any diet done for a short period of time and then you get back to a diet. First of all, diet itself is not the right word that you follow. Um, and intermediate fasting is a certain type of lifestyle that you can follow the incredible health benefits for cancer prevention and for those who have cancer. Um, maybe next. No, I think yes. it's a very well, very valid point. I think Pele, I mean, see all my grandmothers, whatever, in those time, the breath rakna is a, I mean, it's, it was a very good intermittent fasting Panda for ladies. And nowadays in like in America and Europe, they're talking about these things that fasting is such a good thing to keep your health good. I think definitely it makes sense. Yes. Yes. And um, also basically I'll tell you how it uh, helps the cancer patients in specific. It brings about something called as uh, autophagy. Now, uh, if you have cancer, uh, the cancer cells actually lose their capability uh, to stop dividing and they go on dividing and dividing and dividing to till no point. So, but then when you do intermittent fasting, um, uh, your body induces something called as autophagy, wherein it starts killing its own can- its own cancer cell. So that's how uh, uh, intermittent fasting helps. It brings about autophagy in your body. 
and it's not only for cancer you know or weight loss or it also helps in managing diabetes and blood pressure or resolving your gut issues like so many um, uh, things that it can help with and there's a lot of research uh, or evidence to it as well okay there was another question about uh, what's your point of view on uh, whether eat only when hungry or versus eating at fixed times irrespective of whether you are hungry or not you would rather eat when you are hungry or not um, in between especially if you are undergoing uh, any kind of um, uh, uh, comorbidities for example diabetes okay it, it, uh, you know the previous dietary guidelines used to say that you need to eat something small for every 2 to 3 hours in order to maintain your blood sugar but now that's not the case you cannot eat something in between or snack unnecessarily in between because that will cause insulin spike in the body and that can cause in so you eat when you're hungry uh, and do not eat too much at a time as well so you need to uh, eat uh, how much ever is required at a time and not too much at a time so because again that can create a havoc in the body so you eat even if it's going to be like three meals just three meals in a day that's more than enough but do not unnecessarily snack in between okay uh, muesli and oats are these refined considered refined foods or uh, no so muesli is usually laced with some amount of sugar uh, and it's and basically muesli is a lot of oats and dried fruits uh and nuts so basically uh muesli is fine but the oats if you really want to have oats then i would suggest having steel cut oats um but yes it's very high in carbohydrate would you recommend a uh, black seed oil for autophagy i don't know what's black seed but yeah somebody has asked that question okay uh, black seed oil i wouldn't really recommend for autophagy but it has a compound called as phylloquinone uh, which has been uh, studied um, on uh, for over a very long period of time and it has shown to uh, improve your immunity and to some extent yes it does help in uh, killing few cancer cells as well according to few of the research articles that i have gone through so but then it's not necessary that you know when you have that black seed oil it's going to bring about autophagy in your body it might or it might not do that work but it that definitely helps in improving your immunity and decreasing inflammation in the body got it i think uh, the last question that we have uh, uh, should we uh, soak rice in water overnight and drink the next morning is it ma'am for okay so the fermented rice porridge is okay i'll tell you how to do that whatever rice is left at night or how much was required just take it in a pot and uh, fill it uh, fill the water uh, so to the extent where it can cover the rice and just leave it as such till morning so just keep it for like maybe 12 13 hours and then you can just drink that water and even eat that rice okay fine thank you what about cbd oil hemp seed oil cbd oil hemp seed oil actually uh, i'm yes there's a lot of research about the same um so to consume uh, they say that it's very good in anti inflammatory properties and also very good for pain management um again something that i can talk to you a lot about because my husband is starting a, a, a cbd hemp company and working a lot with oncology patients so you can contact me directly got it let me just uh, look at some of the questions which were submitted uh, we just uh, take a couple of more minutes uh, okay acidic versus alkaline food uh what's the deal with that um there's no specific 
your evidence behind uh, you following a specific alkaline diet. So because, for example, say even if you do eat a lot of alkaline food in the end, your body will produce enough acid in order for it to get digested. Uh, so, yeah, there's no science behind it. Okay. Uh, are there any specific recommended foods during or after chemotherapy? But it would actually depend. In this we will go. Uh, it, it really depends on person to person type of treatment, stage of treatment. Uh, uh, said, um, uh, you know, if you can attend our next session, we'd really go deep into the type of to be consuming during treatment and post treatment. Got it. Cool. I think we have covered uh, most of the other questions. So. Uh, Anybody okay, so any, has any other last details. question? Great. So we put our contact details. Okay, okay, let's go for it. Sorry. Yeah, Samara, you were saying something. No, I was just saying that we have details there. Our email addresses. No, there. I was just our saying that we have there. Like there. Our email address. We're happy there. to set up a consultation or just happy to send us your questions and we'll answer them. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, Nikhat and Samara. This was a, a pretty awesome yeah. session and we are already looking forward to the yeah. next one as well because I know that uh, uh, there are some people who are actually uh, here today uh, who also, uh, uh, I mean, who are essentially cancer survivors at this point of time, right? So I know that it's something which will be of interest to a, a lot of people. And please uh, let your friends know who might be friends or relatives uh, etc who might be afflicted by the disease please let them know about the next session as well right uh, do you want to give us a quick uh, what are you going to cover in the next session samara yes so we are going to really cover yes. about, so are, um, going to really uh, cover about how are the various actually uh, shamit is a bit of an echo actually uh, shamit is a bit of an echo i'm not sure that's happening it is actually happening here as well i don't know it why. is actually happening here as well Okay, maybe Everybody it should, should be fine now. Oh my Mute, yeah. Yes, I think it's fine now. So the next session is going to be uh, what are basically what we essentially do is that we tell you exactly how you can decrease your side effects of treatment and improve your immunity immunity to decrease your relapse rate. So what we're going to do in the next session is tell you all the contributing factors that um, can decrease your side effects of treatment and have less toxicity in the body. And we're going to go through every single pain point and side effect a, a cancer patient might go through and what they can do in their lifestyle using food, body and mind to improve their outcomes and, and improve their clinical outcomes as well. And we're going to also talk about what uh, uh, leads to decreased relapse rates. So we will tell you certain types of foods that you should be consuming uh, whether you're taking chemotherapy or if you're on hormonal therapy, um, we're going to break it down to the types of cancers and the, and the kinds of exercises you should be doing, the kinds of diets you should be following. And we're going to spend a large percentage of that also on, inter, um, on intermittent fasting because that's something that we really condone in the kind of food that we prescribe and the diets we prescribe. So uh, very much lifestyle factors to improve your outcomes, who's going through cancer and who's been through cancer and how to decrease your relapse rates. Got it. I have one question about carer, right? So uh, how does carer engage with, uh, uh, do, does carer only engage with uh, uh, patients or even for preventive care, number one. Number two is that you, when you engage for, uh, uh, for people who already have cancer, uh, what are the, like, is it primarily a nutrition related protocol or you work on all of the various angles and how do you, how do you actually do it? So Cara essentially started as a company called, uh, which was integrative oncology. What we essentially did was we, pro we provide non-clinical therapies and holistic therapies from a very medical standpoint to manage the side effects of treatment and improve the quality of life. So initially we were only working with those who have been diagnosed with cancer, any stage, any cancer, we've worked with over five to 600 cancer patients and about 43 cancer types. And we do it from a very uh, assessment point of view. So we, we assess every parameter and we measure everything. So we work with more or less every hospital and hundreds of doctors around the country. Um, the way that we work and the concept of integrative oncology is very common and it's a very common way of treating patients around the world. 
It's just India and countries like India don't have it and Kero is the only company that does it as of right now. Uh, so we help in improving the recovery rates of a patient, help in improving the side effects of treatment and decrease relapse rate of the patient. Today, we have also got into cancer prevention where we guide people with whatever, whether it's a gut issue, whether it's diabetes, thyroid, obesity, or if they're just health conscious, we, we do an assessment of them and then we tell them what they can make in their life to bring their risk down. And we keep assessing their risk factor to make sure that they come down risk factor. Uh, so we're very much working with prevention as well. And we do have different products available we have our integrative program where you can actually have access to all our therapists and we guide uh, uh, everyday basis or weekly basis and you know you have one-on-one -on -one sessions or we also have these just purchase where it will tell you everything you need to know to keep your risks low or to manage cancer you know it depends on what you want uh, but you know we we take a lot of free consults so we can have to us and we can do the consult in terms of uh, whether it is only nutrition it is not only nutrition but the foundation of what we do but we also provide um, a therapeutic yoga since we provide physiotherapy we provide counseling we do manage the other aspects but the foundation of what we do is nutrition yes got it cool uh, thank you thank you so much guys it's been almost two hours but it was very engaging very useful and we look forward to the next weekend as well i'm going to post the link uh, for the self assessment test do uh, take the test because i think it will kind of also build upon some of the things that we talked touched upon today right as at least from the nutrition perspective but i had a quick uh, glance at the assessment uh, as well and i think it talks about other factors beyond the nutrition piece it uh, takes into account all of those other 15 factors that we covered in the initial slide right so uh, do take that test Okay. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, talk to you next weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.